Hello, my name is Peace Anthony Doko. I am the Director of Finance and Administration. I'm seeing um, this faces for the first time and um, we're gonna have a conversation tonight together. So this evening, um, we're having a webinar and um, it's all about deepening our understanding you know, as it relates to insurance, to understand what is happening in the insurance market. Quite a number of us might have been informed before, but um, there are new things to learn every time. So we have with us here tonight, um, Rob from Aeon. Hi. And um, okay, Rob, Rob is already here with us. Rob Ferguson will be our lead person tonight and he will be putting us through on all the things that we need to know concerning um, insurance. We're gonna be spending together here not more than an hour and a half. And um, we're going to have a section of um, presentation. And after the presentation, we will have uh, the Q&A section, the question and answer. And um, just as we have on the screen, if you have questions for the presenter, please add them to the chat box. As the presentation is going on, Please send in your questions in the box. And uh, we have someone in the background who will be responsible for putting our questions together so that when it's time for Q&A, um, Rob will do justice to all our questions. And um, I think that will be it for now. So um, the ne next person will be Rob, who will go straight Great. into the presentation. Rob, over to you. Great, thanks, Peace. All right, screen should be up. Um, so thanks everyone for joining me tonight, uh, joining us tonight. Um, as Peace mentioned, I'm I'm Rob. I'm uh, the insurance broker for the with Aon, and uh, we administer the uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada insurance program. Um, some of you might be members, some not. Um, this program is of course open to to all uh, all all churches. So. Um, I'm going to start with kind of a review of some insurance basics. Um, we will talk a bit on on the program as a whole and uh, open it up for questions after that. So, insurance. Uh, I I'll try not to dwell on this, but I just I love the subject of insurance history. It actually goes back to uh, Lloyd's of London, which you may have heard because they. They do uh, a lot of high-end policies. Um, you might have heard um, celebrities will get uh, will get insurance for if they're a singer, they'll insure their voice, or an actor might insure might insure their their smile. Um, Lloyd's of London actually started as a coffee shop in the 1680s. Uh, in the early days, that was where uh, uh, sea captains, merchant captains, would meet, have their coffee, and and plan their voyages. Um, Earlier on and back in the day, of course, if you were uh, going to go take a voyage, it was going to take at the minimum several months. Um, and between piracy and mother nature and just bad luck, it was uh, the probability of losses was was always there. So insurance started with a group of these sailors banding together and basically agreeing that if one of them were to suffer a loss, they'd all pick in a bit of money to help indemnify the person. So if they did suffer a loss, they weren't going to be financially ruined. Um, and the thinking behind that was basically you encourage people to go out and take the risk. In this case, it was charting a, charting a voyage to, to the New World or elsewhere. Um, the intention was to encourage people to give them the incentive to pursue an already risky endeavor. It helped kind of minimize the, the chance of complete ruin and, and otherwise. So, um, you know, insurance kind of really starts there. Um, you know, we start to evolve after a couple hundred years of having large, larger urban centers. There were, of course, back in the day, fire protection wasn't what it was. So you had these huge fires. Um, there's the Great Fire of London in the, don't know the exact date, but in the 1700s, um, created kind of a need for regular people to buy insurance because you could own a house, you could put money into it. And this was all good for the economy and, and, and society in general. But most people aren't going to carry around the money to buy a second house if the first one burns down. So the basic principle is to help the losses of the few by spreading the risk over a larger group. Um, there we are. Quick overview on, on how insurance works. So I'm with Aon. We're the insurance broker. 
It's our job to administer the program as a whole, and we act as the middleman between you, the client, and the insurance companies. Um, our job is not to just go out and get some quotes, but it's to provide risk management, manage the flow of information, and, and provide advisory services. Um, insurance can be is a very, very complicated uh, uh, topic. There's all sorts of precedent. There's all sorts of regulation on it. Um, and while it'd be great if the average consumer could just call an insurance company and get a policy, in practice, you're you're at a huge information disadvantage if you're dealing with an insurance company because they, of course, know insurance well, and you as the end consumer are probably not going to be as knowledgeable as someone who's had 30 years experience. Um, the insurer for the, the particular program we, we run is ecclesiastical. Um, they're the ones who set the rates, the premium. They're the ones who are responsible for administering and playing, uh, paying out claims and setting the risk management and underwriting criteria. Um, so the insurance company, they're the ones who have the actuaries on the back end who calculate probability of loss, um, profit margin, all of that. And they crunch all of those numbers, put them together, and that's how you get your rates. Um, rates, of, of course, are, get, are determined by geographic location, previous loss history, um, character of the building and 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 type of operation. So, uh, you know, oh, say a, a mom and pop shop a corner store is going to have a very different risk from a, a large multinational oil company. Um, so the broker's role, as is, is mentioned, is, is to act as sort of the middleman between, uh, and I'm just, sorry, going to move my box because it's locking my screen. There we are. Uh, uh, they act as the middleman between the communities and the insurance company. So it's our job as the broker to have you, the client's interest at heart. Um, one of my uh, oft repeated lines is I say, it's, it's not my job to stick up for the insurance company or apologize for them or defend them. Um, it's our job to re represent the interests of our clients. At the end of the day, while the insurance companies are supposed to pay out claims and set fair rates, in practice, we know that they, uh, an individual consumer is going to need someone in their corner, and that's kind of where the broker comes in. Um, we also do provide some advisory services. Uh, we'll can have a fulsome conversation with, with you about your insurance needs. And of course, our job is to translate the insurance speak that the insurance company produces into uh, understandable information so that you understand the product you're purchasing. Um, it's also our job to really keep abreast of trends in the industry, changes in the industry. Um, as, uh, as we all know, we, we have emerged from the COVID pandemic. Uh, that was probably this, uh, and my hope is I never see another event like this until I'm long retired from the industry. But that was a huge jarring event that, um, that shifted the market in, in ways we really, we on our end would have had a hard time to anticipate. Um, the insurer's role is to really, they're on the analysis side. So they really look at the numbers, um, you know, insurers, the bulk of the work at insurance company is determined by, uh, by underwriters. They're the ones who will review policies. They're the ones who set the appropriate rates. Um, they do owe you a, a duty of good faith and fair dealing when handling a transaction. Um, however, at the end of the day, the insurance company's goal is to make money. Um, they do have the obligation to faithfully investigate claims, uh, to honor valid claims, and uh, if a claim's fraudulent, to, to you know, investigate and give rationale for why they wouldn't be doing a payout. Um, you know, I think, uh, again, I, I, don't, uh, I don't need to stick up or apologize for the insurance industry, but at the end of the day, fraudulent claims, you know, Lead to, lead to premium inflation, everyone ends up paying more. So it is within everyone's interest for the insurance company to make sure that claims are valid. Um, insurers do also make sure they need to keep enough reserve funds to pay out all possible claims. Um, so the insurers will all have set reserves, uh, basically the amount of money they need to keep on hand uh, in the event they get hit with a rush of claims at once. At once. Um, at the end of the day, what insurers do is they don't just take your premium money and sit it, sit it in an account. They take most of it and it ends up getting invested into the market. So, you know, if, <coughs> excuse me, if you follow the stock market at all, um, 
the stock market has a huge determining effect on, on rates because if insurance companies are able to make money off of that, you know, they're usually able to charge a lower rate. If the stock market, if markets are, are, are tentative, if we're kind of in a 2008 situation where we're seeing a big market crash, that does affect your insurance rates because insurers are making less money on their return on investment. Um, in the event you've had to have uh, had to go through the claim process, either uh, part of your church, maybe part of a business you're involved with, or, or maybe uh, maybe your own home, um, you've dealt with an adjuster. Um, the adjusters are supposed to be at arm's length from the insurance company. So it's their job when a claims filed to do the investigation. Um, I do know, um, you know, and, and just to uh, give a distinction, Aon does maintain our own claims team and whose job it is to advocate on behalf of you as the client and to talk to the adjuster. Um, when a claim's ongoing, make sure that they're doing their due diligence. Um, if there's any issues or if we feel like the adjuster is not seeing what we want to see on this, it's it's the our claims team's job to advocate on behalf of our client. Um, I do know if, if you have a claim it, uh, you know, claims are never fun to begin with. You're, you're usually dealing with a, a pretty big loss. You know, you're dealing with the headache of, of having to contact the insurance company, get the, get the item repaired or, or pay out the liability claim. Um, so oftentimes adjusters can be seen as the bad guys, but really their job is to just make sure that the claim that you're that you're going to get paid out on is something that you've been insured for. Um, again, adjusters will outsource where needed. Um, a lot of times, adjusters will outsource to contractors uh, just to just to make sure that if your house burns down and you get a quote for a repair, that it's it's within the market. If you have a half a million dollar home and it burns down, you can't go and rebuild a million dollar home to replace it. It has to be of similar value. Um, and they're the ones who will ultimately are the ones who negotiate the settlement and payment of claims. Um, so adjusters sometimes get a bad rep, but they are they are looking out for everyone's interest uh, in the industry. Um, we talked a bit on about about insurance rates. Um, so really, the baseline for for what you pay as a premium is the risk. Um, you know, certain operations carry certain risks. Uh, you know, if a uh, a church with a relatively small congregation that doesn't run childcare, that's located in the part of downtown Toronto, is going to be seen as a safer risk than a church that might be rural, uh, you know, further away from a from a fire hall to respond. Um, you know, and, and operations, of course, are a big factor. Um, for churches who have a daycare, um, know that you do pay a premium to ensure that. And it's just because there's always a risk the more operations they do. Um, and of course, insurance companies will, uh, insurance rates are determined by claims. Um, the particular program we run uh, uh, with ecclesiastical is pooled. So if one church has a claim, it's not affecting their individual rates. That's spread across, across the whole program. And basically it's, you know, recognizing that if a church, you know, we, I think there was a, a pretty big fire loss last year. Uh, maybe the church is uh, on this call on that one. Um, you know, it want to, it's not fair if you've suffered a loss for something that's outside of your control to be penalized it. So these group programs kind of help pool that, uh, help pool that potential loss. Um, you know, other items, um, uh, physical attributes are probably the biggest determinant. So, um, building type is a big one. Um, a lot of the older churches are, tend to be made of masonry. So their stone, stone, uh, basically doesn't burn down. Um, a lot of the newer churches, and, and this is a trend, of course, across Canada, is most most buildings that have been built after the Second World War are usually wood frame. Um, there's advantages of wood frame. It's it's cheaper, it's accessible, it's easy to replace. But of course, wood's much more flammable. So, you know, the physical aspect is, is very important. Um, you know, things like fire protection services. Uh, if you have a fire hydrant outside of your church, that's great. If the hydrant's two blocks down, again, that's, that's you know, we're talking about a difference of five, 10 minutes to get a hookup done, um, which in the event of a fire can can make a huge difference. Um, responding fire services, uh, you know, if you're, if you're close to a fire hall, you need to call the firemen, they're right there. Uh, fire people, they're right there. Um, if you're, you know, if the closest fire hall is 30 kilometers away, it's going to take them more time to respond to, to a potential alarm. 
Um, lost history is, of course, important. Um, you know, when we do talk about lost history, context is really important. Um, I, I use the example of a fire, uh, you know, if a fire happens because you just had a had an arsonist, that's something that's a little harder to protect on. If you have a fire loss because the church, you know, you've plugged uh, 50 outlets into the kitchen, into the kitchen outlet and, and you cause an electrical fire, that's viewed as something that you as the end user can control. So um, companies are, insurance companies, they're not perfect on this, but they're a little more forgiving of claims that are seen as outside of your control versus a claim that's there due to maybe uh, less than ideal risk management. Um, so managing losses is really important. Um, risk control is, 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 is really, really important. Um, Aon, we can always provide feedback on this if, if anyone has any risk control questions. Um, I know um, several of the uh, uh, church members have reached out to me with questions, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the youth groups going on a going on a trip for the weekend to a camp that's going to be supervised or you're running a daycare or you're doing a renovation. Um, there's always risk involved. So it's great to always communicate whether you're on the program or not always communicate with your broker because they can provide feedback. Um, and again, when we're doing anything, it's really important to notify the insurer. Once the insurer is aware of an operation and they haven't said no to it, it's covered. Um, you know, within the within the within the wordings of the policy. So if you tell the insurance company you're you're running an on-site daycare and they say, yep, go ahead, that's going to be insured. If you're running an on-site daycare and you haven't told your insurance provider, um, you're going to want to do that right away because if you have a loss associated with that daycare, the insurer is going to turn around and say, you never told us about this. We're not covering this operation. Um, you know, I, I think there's, um, there is occasionally run into the mindset of people who want to, you know, potential clients who maybe don't want to tell the insurance company because they know it's going to affect their premium, but better to tell the insurance company, pay a few bucks more than it is to not tell them, deal with a loss and, and have a claim denied. Um, so there are tons of insurance uh, uh, available. Um, use the example, uh, you know, we talked about celebrities going through Lloyd's of London. Um, celebrities like Julia Roberts having her smile insured for $30 million. Uh, David Beckham insures his legs for $195 million. Um, basically because they recognize that those physical aspects are a big part of how these people make their money. Um, I, I worked with a, a longtime uh, insurance industry gentleman who 50 years experience uh, and his line was anything is insurable for the right price. Um, so if you can think of it, you can get insurance for it. Um, most all of you will have to maintain some form of homeowners policy. Um, what we're really focusing on and, and what my area of expertise is, is on the commercial side. Um, so when you talk commercial insurance, it's commercial property, basically a building that's, uh, that's not a personal dwelling. It might not necessarily be open to the public, but it's, it's somewhere where people come in who don't, who might not own it, people who might not live there. Um, commercial general liability is a big one. Um, that's your basic, you know, if someone slips, falls, hurts themselves on the premises and, and, and alleges it's because you weren't maintaining it, you know, you didn't shovel the walkway and they slipped on it. That's where your liability comes in. Um, liability policies, uh, these days usually start at about $2 million. Um, very rarely you'll see lower than that. Um, they go up to five and, and, you know, depending on, um, the risk in the operation, liability can stack, you know, to the tens of millions of dollars. Um, I, I worked with, for a few industries and, you know, clients that do, uh, for example, mining work or, or oil exploration usually have to get liability policies in the tens of millions, because if they make a mistake, it's going to be very costly. Um, commercial equipment breakdown is a big one. It, it often gets overlooked because premium wise, it's a relatively small part. You're, you're, you're looking at usually only a, a few hundred dollars for a, an equipment breakdown policy. Um, property policies exclude a number of things, um, including anything related to um, pipes bursting. Um, if the boiler um, goes kaput um, suddenly and accidentally, those are excluded under a standard property policy. 
So um, the industry developed about 30, 40 years ago, what they call these equipment breakdown policies. They're also called boiler policies. Um, and those are designed to, to cover off any equipment that might be attached to the building um, if it suffers a sudden and accidental loss. Um, emphasis is on the sudden and accidental. If you have a 60 year old boiler and it goes, um, you're likely not gonna get that covered. The insurance company is gonna say, it was 60 years old, it was due for a replacement. You have a boiler that's five years old and it, it explodes, well, then you have a claim on your hands and, and you can get compensated uh, for that by the insurance company, assuming you do have the equipment breakdown coverage. Um, two aspects that are probably uh, uh, maybe not as well understood, but extremely important to, uh, frankly, to any church are um, abuse. So allegations or acts of um, psychological, sexual, or physical abuse are going to be ex are excluded under a general liability policy. Um, a separate abuse policy exists, and it's designed to protect the organization, not the, not the perpetrator. So if a member of the church does something they weren't supposed to have done, person comes up and says, this was abusive, I've suffered losses because of it, you have an abuse policy to cover the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada and the individual church. So if you were to get dragged into a lawsuit, you know, the losses would be covered under that. Um, it's also important to note that insurance companies do have a duty to defend when you're when you're dealing with a loss. So um, even if you do end up paying it out, the insurance company will be responsible for helping you find legal counsel. Um, sometimes you might have a lawyer you want to use you usually have to get the insurer to sign off and say, yeah, we're good with you using that person. Um, but the duty to defend is huge because, um, especially with a, with a claim like abuse, um, even the allegation can be can end up being quite costly. Um, I have um, unfortunately seen, uh, seen a few abuse claims. Um, more often than not, they're very tough to prove and, and they might not go anywhere, but even if they haven't gone anywhere, the defense costs are huge. Um, insurance companies can also help you if they think, you know, the case is pretty shut and dry, they might help you reach a settlement with the party. So again, they can take a lot of that headache out of your hands and, and take that on. Um, final aspect, uh, uh, you know, and this is again, uh, not unique to the program, but not a coverage that has to be specifically purchased is a uh, directors and officers coverage. So directors and officers is designed to protect boards um, volunteer groups, basically um, managing organizations from uh, from lawsuits and losses. So, if let's say the uh, let's say one particular congregation has purchased, uh, you know, you've purchased a new building or you've purchased a land that you're going to develop uh, in the future, and there's an issue with that, with you know, the person you bought it from alleges you were uh, there was a breach of contract or something like that. Uh, directors and officers is designed to protect the individuals associated with the board. Um, I uh, uh, up until recently, I was on the board of a small nonprofit. Uh, being an insurance person, when I joined, the first question I had was, "Do you have board protection?" Uh, and it turns out they didn't, so I, I pushed for that um, just out of my own self interest because it does protect the individual. Uh, members who might sit on the church council from, from being dragged, if they do get dragged into a lawsuit, it protects your personal assets by, by, by kind of stepping in there. Um, another aspect of, of directors and officers coverage uh, is that it also provides for unfair dismissal. Um, so if you've had an employee of the church or the organization that you have to let go, and they allege that they were you know fired unfairly, usually they'll end up naming the management team and if they do decide they're gonna take you to court, so directors and officers coverage helps and will indemnify you for those losses as well. Um, very quick, I think we uh, we actually just kind of went through that. So the the ELC program has sort of three major components. One's the property casualty and equipment breakdown. Um, that does include losses due to crime. Um, we also have abuse um, and then directors and officers. And th those are sort of the three pillars that we have on the program. Um, when it comes to property, um, you know, a lot of factors that the insurer will look into. Um, location's huge. Um, again, if if you have a building right in the heart of uh, downtown Winnipeg here, you're gonna you're gonna 
pay a premium uh, based off of that risk. If you have a building located maybe in uh, in Melita, Manitoba, a lot quieter. Um, usually, urban usually uh, rural properties usually carry less of a risk for crime, um, but they usually because they're further away from from emergency services, the potential for a total loss is greater. So that's all factored into into where how your premiums determined. Um, we talked about construction. Um, uh, type of construction building is huge. Um, again. Uh, there's a rating scale, basically, and wood frame is rated the least safe. Um, uh, masonry is second. We have steel frame, and then um, the absolute safest is um, uh, non-combustible, which is usually a, a very reinforced steel frame. Um, you usually won't see a small building that's built non-combustible. That's usually reserved for large, large office towers. Um, occupancy is always huge. Um, again, if the building's open to the public, there's always a risk with that. If it's uh, a small office is going to be seen as less of a risk uh, than, say, an auto shop, because, of course, an auto shop, you have people coming and going, you have equipment, you have all sorts of stuff that that could potentially injure someone. Um, so, again, what a, what a building is being used for is really important. Um, protection is big. Um, Crime and fire protection are huge. Um, I think most of the churches we have on the program have um, an automated fire alarm and an automated burglary alarm. Um, I, I would encourage anyone, if you have a business, get it alarmed. Um, for one, it usually leads to a fair rating on that, um, but also just a matter of, of having something to deter potential thieves. You know, a loud alarm when someone smashed a window is, is usually a good way to send them running. Um, if you have an automatic sprinkler system, um, that's a funny one because there are advantages to that in terms of fire protection. Uh, protection. However, automatic sprinklers can also cause damage themselves when they go off, which is indemnified by the insurance policy. Um, but there's a recognition that a small fire could lead to the whole building getting doused, um, which does lead to cleanup costs. Um, and then exposure is, is very huge, um, again, What's it nearby? Um, you know, close to bod bodies of water, um, forestry. We we saw some pretty um, pretty nasty wildfires this this summer, um, and and we are seeing that with with uh, with properties that are located close to forest areas. Is they are if you are, you're probably going to see a bit of a rate increase because of these losses over the last year. Um, if a community is very remote, you're going to pay more than uh, you're going to pay a premium for that because again you're less close to responding to emergency services. And then overall, you know, what is near the community? Um, I use the example of downtown Winnipeg. Uh, I know, uh, unfortunately, most storefront businesses in Winnipeg are, are hit with pretty high deductibles for, for crime because, um, well, we're dealing with a few issues on our streets these days. Um, glass breakage is huge. Uh, and I know more than a few business owners are a little annoyed because they've had their deductibles set quite high um, by the insurance companies, and they can't get lower deductibles, and that's because they're in what's seen and what the data is showing to be a fairly high crime area. Um, Coinsurance, very important. So I talked earlier about um, making sure you're declaring everything, open communication with the insurance company. Uh, Coinsurance is a provision that allow that basically makes sure that when you're insuring an item, you're insuring it to value. Um, so typically, um, you usually have a 90% coinsurance rate. So that means if you have a $200,000 house, um, if you have a 90% coinsurance clause, you're going to need to insure that to a minimum of $180,000 to avoid a coinsurance penalty. So you are given a bit of leeway with coinsurance. Um, now, if you have that $200,000 house and you are insuring it for $100,000 and you have a loss, the insurance companies, that's one, going to be one of the first things they look at is what is the proper value. They'll run an analysis and comes. Uh, you usually do a per square footage value. Um, and if you're not insuring the value, even if you, your claim is not to the full amount, they're going to claw that back. So you might have a $10,000 loss, but if you've only insured half of what you need to, you're only going to get $5,000. Um, something we can always assist with is... Um, you know, we're not, I don't quite have the tools that the insurance company has when they determine this, but if ever you're concerned about 
are we ensuring the value? Um, feel free to contact me. Um, we do have a few tools to ballpark. Uh, really, the range you should be at for property insurance. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, we do encourage um, there. These are these are not cheap, but getting a building evaluation done um, is pretty iron tight. Um, again, if if you do have an insurance loss and the insurance company is starting to dispute the values, if you have a, a building evaluation done by a by a certified evaluator. Um, that's sort of a big item to have in your corner. Um, and of course, if you do a building evaluation, always good to file with the insurance company. Uh, makes it very hard for them to deny a claim afterwards. Um, so quick example, uh, and we kind of use this is, so back to our $200,000 house, which I, I don't know where you guys are. I, I think in Winnipeg, $200,000 would, would probably net you a shoebox these days, but let's go with that. Um, Let's say you have a $200,000 house and you've only insured it at $140,000. This is actually very common because a lot of times people get a policy, they'll keep it in place for years and they won't adjust their values up because again, you're gonna pay more of a premium for that. Where it does come to bite you is if you haven't touched the values for decades, the cost of replacing whatever you're insuring has almost certainly gone up at that stage and you're likely under insuring. So, in this case, because the insured value is less than 90% of the $200,000, you're going to get a penalty applied to all losses. So a $50,000 loss in this case, um, the insurance company would look at the amount of insurance you carried, 140, um, divided by the replacement cost by 90% times your amount of loss. Um, so for a $50,000 uh, $50, loss, you're only going to get 70 cents on the dollar for that. Um, oh, so you'd only be getting $35,000 for that. I think I did that math right. Um, please correct me if I got that wrong. I know you're, uh, you're the, you're the finance person. Um, so really, really important to, as you're insuring and, and not just for the churches, again, I recommend take a look at your homeowner's policy. And if that number on your policy, you know, if you ask yourself, could I rebuild my house for the number that's on the policy? And if the answer is no. I really do recommend bumping that up. Um, I don't work in personal insurance, but um, it's it's something I do always recommend. Um, general liability. So this is sort of the the other side of of most commercial policies. Um, so this is designed to protect you against liability to the public or any third party. Um, GL policies started off as very basic uh, bodily and, and mental injury, so uh, slip and fall. Um, they've expanded over the years to include property damage, um, personal and advertising injuries. So again, if you're being accused of libel or slander, uh, your general liability policy comes in. Contract contractual liability. So if you're accused of not fulfilling the contract, your general liability policy kicks in um, to protect the organization. Um, tenants legal liability. So if you're leasing a space, You'll have a tenant's policy that'll cover you if you, when you vacate the space and the landlord comes back and says, you left it a mess, you destroyed everything, you have to pay me for these. That's the tenant's liability policy covers that. Um, and employer's liability, uh, which is basically um, meant to cover you for, uh, if there's any issues with, um, the most common example on this one is if an employee's uh, came on board and you have a benefits plan and you didn't enroll them properly and they suffer an injury, um, the employer's liability acts as a backfill if there was an administering error on that. Um, the most common one we see on, on this type of claim is someone gets hired, whoever at the admin forgets to enroll them in the benefits plan, they have an event, you know, they have a work injury or something and they need to make a claim, the benefits uh, insurer will turn around and say, nope, this person was never registered, we're not covering them. So employer's liability acts kind of a backfill to that. Um, there are, of course, some key exclusions on this. Um, so injury to an employee is not gonna be covered. Um, that is covered under a worker's compensation policy. Um, that should cover the individual for their losses. Um, there are accidental death and dismemberment policies that, that an organization can purchase, um, again, Usually that's going to be covered under your WCB though. Um, auto is always going to be automatically excluded. However, um, our, our pro, sorry. 
However, um, our program does provide two key automobile coverages. Um, one is called non-owned auto coverage. So um, common one is, let's say, you know, the church group is on an outing and you've, you've leased a van and a member from the church is driving everyone. Um, there's going to be an auto liability coverage for that person as long as what they're doing was on church business. Um, that's going to cover their, what we call the non-owned auto coverage. Um, and there is a damage to hired vehicles. So again, let's say you rent a van, you get an offender bender, um, your commercial policy, again, as long as it was done on church business, is going to cover the physical damage to the car that the rental agency is going to come after you for. Um, what, auto, what the non-owned auto policy won't cover is it will not cover, um, and I don't think we've ran into this yet, but if the church itself owns a, owns a vehicle, a van, a bus, something, you need to place a separate auto policy for that. Um, again, it, it does vary by jurisdiction. This program's Canada-wide, so uh, BC, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba have public insurers. Um, they're relatively straightforward to deal with. Um, Alberta, Ontario, and the Maritimes have private insurers, so you have to go out, get quotes, and, and place the coverage. Um, and uh, I know Quebec has their own kind of program. Um, Quebec's a very different beast when it comes to insurance, so we have... Um, we have local contacts in there who could explain it better, but I'm, I'm not very familiar with Quebec law. Um, wrongful dismissal is not going to be covered under a general liability policy. That's why we maintain the directors and officers policy, because that is, uh, DNO policies will cover wrongful dismissal. Um, and any complaints under the human rights code, including sexual harassment. And again, that's why we have your abuse policy to act as a backfill for that. Um, so we talked a bit about DNO. Um, basically, it, it is going to cover any of the the directors or officers' own wrongful wrongful acts, um, anything with managing funds, making decisions on the members, any governing decisions, contract disputes. Um, that's going to be covered under the DNO. And, and basically, uh, directors and officers exists to protect boards, many of whom are done by volunteers. Um, you know, from getting dragged into a lawsuit. Um, you know, wouldn't be fair if someone volunteers their time and they end up having to pay out of pocket for an insurance claim. Um, now, there are some exclusions, of course, on, on DNO that it is important to, uh, to exclude. Um, so they will not include breach of contract. So if uh, an individual has been acting outside of their scope of responsibility, if they've done something illegal, dishonest, um, you know, they, they won't cover you for human rights codes. Again, the human rights stuff would be covered under the abuse policy. So, um, again, uh, basically, DNO covers a lot, but it's not going to cover you for anything criminal. Um, and it doesn't cover fines and penalties if you've been found to have acted uh, improperly. Um, and just a quick aside, like, on by practice, most church councils wouldn't have to worry about this. Um, you know, if you've done maybe a handshake agreement with a developer on, on, on a sale of an asset that wasn't entirely above board, that's not going to be covered. If a member has physically assaulted a member, that wouldn't be covered. But as long as the members are acting in good faith, you are going to get this covered. And there is a duty to defend on directors and officers' claims. So you will have the insurance company step in to help with that. Um, we talked about abuse. Um, this is always a very tough one to play. Um, insurers, they offer abuse coverage, and they but they don't like it because abuse covered claims, though rare, it's very rare we see them pursued fully to a payout, but when they happen, they're costly. There's a reputation cost. Um, you know, there's, there's again, just the nature of them. It's, it's usually something that's intensely personal, so they can be very ugly claims. Um, again, the insurer has the obligation to defend. Um, I, I would actually uh, mention the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. Um, we have your uh, abuse protocols on file. Um, I hope everyone here has taken a look at them. Um, they're very, very robust. Uh, I, I fully believe if every church council follows the policy, you will never have an abuse claim. Well, you're very unlikely to. Never say never. Um, so a couple of years ago, there was the... 
very, very upsetting story that emerged, of course, um, from some of the residential schools where they, they found the bodies of children at some of the sites. Um, this had a huge effect on how insurers are starting to review faith-based organizations. Now, our stance has always been the ELCIC wasn't involved in this. It's not something they've really done. And, and frankly, your exposure is much lessened because you're not run, you know, there's a ton of Anglican and Catholic schools. The, the Lutheran Church, I know there's a couple, but it, it's not really a, a big focal point. However, every faith-based organization um, was getting hit by this. Um, insurers were starting to get very hesitant um, because it kind of raised the question of what claims might be emerging down the line. Um, Currently, the, the policy we run is on a, uh, what we call a per-occurrence basis. So a per-occurrence uh, basis means that you have a policy that goes from March 31 of one year to March 31 of the next year. If the incident of abuse happens during that period, it will be covered. Um, so if you have an abuse policy in place and it emerges that five years ago, someone abused a member of this ch of church and they're coming out and, and filing a lawsuit now. As long as you had a policy in place back then, it'll maintain. The nice thing about these is if you lapse the abuse policy, you're still covered for past years. You won't be covered for future years if you've lapsed it, but previous claims are gonna be covered. Um, most abuse policies that we see written these days are written on a claims made basis. A policy is claims made, meaning that um, the policy will only, it doesn't matter when it happened, as long as the policy is active, it will cover the abuse claim. However, um, by practice, most abuse policies will include a retroactive date. Um, usually it's from inception. So um, if, you, if you decide you're going to go with a claims made policy, they'd say, great, everything after February 22nd, 2024, we're going to cover, but we are not going to cover anything that happened before you bought the policy. Um, the advantage of this is if a church does leave the program, you still have the abuse policy uh, with us because it was on a per occurrence basis. Um, claims made policies also, once the policy lapses, that coverage ceases to exist. You can't file a claim once the policy's lapsed. So if you let a policy lapse and you know, six months down the line, someone comes out and says there was abuse that happened during the policy period. Doesn't matter. Insurer is going to wash their hands of it. Um, for those churches that might be on a claims made policy uh, for abuse, um, if you're ever in a situation, maybe the church is winding down operations, um, you can purchase tails, what they call tails on, on claims made policies, which basically extend the policy life beyond its, its lapse date. Um, so if you were to lapse a policy today, February 22nd, 2024, you buy a two-year tail, you're still going to be covered for any claim as long as it emerged prior to the state up until February 22nd, 2026. Um, and again, this is a little, this is a little in the weeds. So uh, if anyone has, has questions on how the abuse policy works, please do fire away. Um, oh, hard versus soft market. So. I won't ask for a show of hands because I know the answer. Uh, um, who here saw their insurance premiums go up over the last four years? Uh, and the answer is everyone. Um, so we were insurance cycles between hard and soft markets. Soft markets are great for consumers. That's when insurance companies are hungry for new risk. They, they fight for it. They want to get more people on the program. So you get the insurers competing with each other. Um, rates tend to go down. Insurers are usually less stringent on coverage because they they want to get people on, so they're not trying to they're not trying to pick through submissions. Um, better deal for consumers. Um, a hard market is when capacity decreases. Insurers basically decide they're not interested in in writing new risk, so rates go up. Coverage becomes hard to secure, um, and you know people who might you might have had an insurer you've been with for a decade. When a hard market hits, suddenly they're coming around and telling you, you've got to fix five things about your building. We don't like it. Now we're all nervous. Um, it's a worse time for consumers in a nutshell. Um, so at the end of 2019, insurance markets were starting to harden. Uh, the pandemic hits in early 2020, and that just exasperated everything. Um, insurers were, I mean, that was... Uh, 
Uh, put it this way, I have a lot of colleagues who are nearing retirement who, when the pandemic hit, decided this was the time to hang it up because they didn't want to have to go through this. And frankly, I don't blame them. Um, it was just, it was as hard a market, I think, as we're going to see, uh, I hope, in my career. Um, it really made it where insurers were not willing to take on new risks. Um, when they did, they were quoting surcharges and existing insurers were coming off risks. So, uh, you know, I had clients who'd had 10 years with an insurance company, no claims, everything was good. The pandemic hits and the insurance company turns around and says, we don't want to work with you anymore. Get coverage elsewhere. Um, we were in a very weird situation prior to 2019 that made the hard market. The pandemic really made it worse, but we were also dealing with an issue of we were in a very long soft market and it wasn't something we'd really seen in the industry before. So from roughly after 9-11, until 2019, there was a long soft market. It is as long a period as a soft market cycle as we've seen. Um, so for consumers, insurance probably became cheaper, at least when accounting for inflation from 2001 to 2019. From 2019 to now, the exact opposite. Um, just a quick uh, uh, pointer on the program. So. How the program works is we spread the risk across Canada for all member churches. Um, reason we do this is this leverages group buying power. So ecclesiastical the insurer doesn't look at each individual church. I mean, they do, but not too closely. They basically look at how the program operates as a whole. This enables us to, to place coverage for churches that might be harder to place. Um, I know some of our churches out in the out in eastern Canada. Um, I, I'm in Winnipeg, by the way, um, so everything Ontario is east to me. Um, the churches in Eastern Canada were dealing with, uh, you know, their older buildings, they're usually harder to risk. Some of the rural churches are harder to risk. The smaller congregations probably would be paying a higher premium if they went on their own. So we kind of leverage out the group buying power. Churches aren't getting penalized if they do have a big loss. Um, it allows us to kind of leverage that, and also it, it does allow us to throw our weight around a little bit. Um, Ecclesiastical has uh, so far been um, pretty much the only insurer that does faith-based organizations that can offer DNO abuse and can write across Canada. And we have looked, we have tried looking at other insurers. Um, so this kind of helps us spread the risk. Again, back to the first slide on on spreading the losses of uh, the few spread across the many. Um, we do provide claims assistance. Um, you know, I uh, I loop in our claims team anytime um, we're made aware of a claim. I encourage uh, the regional representatives to do so at the same time, and it's their job to to kind of prod the insurance company to make sure that they're delivering on their end. Um, and one final thing that uh, ecclesiastical does that uh, we don't I I haven't seen from other insurers is they do offer zero percent financing, um, which I would encourage. I know I know a lot of churches do like to pay all up front, but I would encourage every member to take advantage of it. It doesn't cost you any more. Um, it lets you lets you spread sort of that payment across throughout the year. Um, and again, it's it's basically free money if if you're looking at the time value of money. Um, to give you an idea of, of the program losses, um, so the 10-year loss ratio on the program is 42%. So that means every dollar of premium the insurer collected, 42 cents got paid out in claims. Um, the five-year loss ratio is a bit more competitive. Um, I've included losses by year to, to kind of give a snapshot on how losses work. Um, as you can see, you know, there's a couple really high claiming years there. Uh, one year where where we, uh, you know, 161% loss ratio, which means the insurance company paid way more out in claims than they collected in premium. Um, overall, though, the, the, the program has had a fairly competitive loss ratio. It's not perfect, but again, when, when you're dealing with a national program, it's, it's inevitable you're going to have losses. Um, so hopefully your individual church hasn't had a loss, but um, if it has, you know, your peers kind of helped you out there by by spreading that risk across um, rather than having to you know fight the insurance company on your own. Um, so a couple quick challenges we do see with it. Um, number one, uh, I think uh, every every contact I've spoken to has mentioned this rate increases. We hear you on that. We're not happy about it either. The issue we deal with with rate increases is um, our 
my our focus first and foremost is to make sure we're maintaining adequate coverage. Um, as mentioned, we were in the long in this hard market cycle. Um, we certainly could have had the option to try to cut premiums down by by maybe starting to remove coverages. Ultimately, though, that does hurt you as the consumer. If you're having a loss, it's better to have it covered. It's better to pay more. My philosophy would be it's better to pay more money up front, know that you're going to be covered for a loss, then, you know, go with the risk, maybe underinsure, and then have a have a huge out-of-pocket loss that's not going to be covered by your insurance company. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be frank, we, we have seen some churches leave the program um, over the years, especially in the hard market. I don't begrudge any church that's left the program. I, I think you're volunteer organizations. You have to do what's best for your church. Um, however, um, we have um, had some churches who've left the program who's kindly provided us with the terms that they've left for. Um, we do see, I mean, we do see some premium savings, but usually that's coming at the cost of coverage. Uh, so probably the biggest one is, uh, we talked about abuse, um, any church that has left the program that has gone on to place an abuse policy, um, they get switched over to a claims made policy, uh, which again, you have to continually maintain that for it to be in place. Um, we see things like directors and officers quote coverage is quoted, but it's at a lower limit. Um, or there's, you know, we see something in the wording that's going to exclude kind of a key part of the operation. Um, so, you know, not all quotes are, are created equal. Um, you know, I, I would say that if any church is, is looking at getting quoted, fair enough. Um, you know, send it in, please. I, I, I'd love to review the quote. Um, I, you know, I'll point out issues. I, I can absolutely understand a church might, you know, might understand that they're leaving because they do want to see a lower premium. Um, but insurance is very much one of those things where, where you do get what you pay for. So, um, and if a quote comes back and it's suspiciously lower, like you're paying half the premium you were before, um, I really, really recommend you double check that because, uh, you know, the the cheapest quote, uh, there's a saying in our industry, the most expensive insurance policy is the one you pay the least for. Um, so you might think a quote, it might look on paper to be equal, but there's there's a lot of stuff, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the wordings, there's exclusions that might not pop out of you. Um, hopefully, if you're working with another broker, they're pointing this out so you're aware of the changes you make. Um, you know, I think most brokers, uh, in my experience, will do that. But every now and then, you'll you'll see a broker who's frankly done the client a disservice and is just trying to get them the rock bottom price, and that's all good for paying up front until you have to file a claim and find that you're not covered. Um, so. That was everything I had on my end. Um, I spoke for a bit longer than I would have liked. Uh, Peace, uh, why don't we turn it over and uh, see how uh, what we had for questions. Wow, thank you so much, Rob. Um, it's been an interesting one. I think right now we'll hand over to Trina who will help us to coordinate the questions. The good thing is that the presentation for tonight is also recorded. So I'm sure we'll have access to it and over and over again. We can go through it for clarity. So Trina, please take over from here. Excellent, thanks. Um, it's We've gotten a few questions coming in on our chat. Um, the presentation was very detailed and a lot of information to absorb. And our first question was, uh, John asked, are the slides available after? Yep. And um, I can answer that in saying, just as P said, we're recording this session and we'll make it available on our website, so um, the slides will be available that way. Great. Um, the second question, before we get too much into some of the other questions, a couple of people mentioned that um, you had skipped over alcohol exclusion in your commentary. I think that was around when we were talking about DNO coverage or just before that. Do you wanna? Yes, yes. Um, so, so most, uh, you basically, you alcohol is going to be something that's automatically excluded unless we declare it to the insurance company. Um, so if the church say rents its hall for, for an event, um, and the, you know, they like in Manitoba, we do wedding socials. I know there's not quite the equivalent, but they're, you know, it's uh, not uncommon that it might take place in a, in a church hall. Um, if you're running a special event, there's, there's usually a couple options. The first person, the first thing is um, if there's someone, holding, putting the event on themselves, 
they should hopefully uh, have their own insurance policy in place that covers alcohol use. Um, we can always look at placing special event policies if maybe the church itself is hosting a mixer and you want to serve some wine. Um, you know, usually with a special event, it's, it's usually not too, too expensive. You're looking at about 100, 200 bucks for that, um, depending on kind of the volume. But you, you get that and that basically would cover you off for alcohol use. So um, we can get out, you know, it's not an, it's not an automatic, you know, no, you can't ever do it. You just have to let us know and, and we can work with you on, on how to get that covered. Great, thanks. Um, Rob, can I get you to just stop screen sharing? If you yes. wouldn't mind. <laughs> there we are. And then I'll remove that pin. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, you touched on a few of the benefits of the ELCIC program, um, but Audrey asked, does Aon get a better rate with Ecclesiastical? Uh, my current insurance broker contacted Ecclesiastical for our insurance renewal and their rate was higher. Um, so, well, the short answer is we should. Um, part of that is we have a really lengthy relationship with Ecclesiastical. Um, and as mentioned, we we run this pooled program. So we're spreading a lot of the losses um, across the members. So the short answer is yes, we should. Now, there are going to always be exceptions. Um, you know, I will say, and I hope I'm not, hope I'm not shooting myself in the foot on this one, but um, you know, if you have a large congregation in a new building, um, yeah, you might be able to leverage a better deal as a one-off for yourself. Um, but a lot of that depends on on certain factors. So um, ecclesiastical, if you're an absolute perfect risk, no claims, new building, um, minimal exposures, um, you know, you might be able to get a better rate off program. I, I haven't seen it happen yet. I'm just talking theoretically here. Um, but usually we should be able to lever leverage a better rate with the program. Um, something we do a lot on the back end is our brokering team negotiates with Ecclesiastical on rates. So um, I know, um, you know, we have seen some rate increases, um, but uh, believe me, they are down from what we had been initially proposed. Um, like I think last year, they, they Ecclesiastical came in, it was, we were looking at like a 20 to 30%, uh, basically it would have been a 20 to 30% premium increase and we were able to push them down on that. So, um, yeah, I, you know, our, our brokering team is, is very strong here. So we should be leveraging a better deal. Um, if we're not, if, if, hey, if any church gets a quote and it is cheaper from ecclesiastical, um, I mean, go for it. If it's the coverage is the same, um, if you wouldn't mind sending it on, because we, we could always use that to leverage a better deal. And we should be, again, we're giving them a lot of business here. Um, through this program, so that should command a, a better level of respect from the underwriters. Great. Um, I'm not sure if this was relating to the first question about alcohol exclusion, but Sandra asked, can a church rent the hall for a celebration that includes alcohol? Yes, short answer is yes. Um, when you do, um, talk to the person you're renting it to. Um, if they're serving alcohol, usually they'll have had to go and get the permit. Um, so that individual, hopefully when they get a permit, they hopefully look at placing coverage, you know, if it's something like a, a celebration of life or something, maybe it's not realistic, in which case, give us a call, you know, we, we could look at placing a special event policy, um, but it's not excluded, just please do let us know so we can work with that. Um, Sheila asked, uh, I think this was when you were talking about GL insurance and injury yeah. to employees, um, your PowerPoint noted, um, that the, that, uh, incidents were typically covered by workers' compensation. Um, but she asked, aren't churches exempt from workers' compensation or are you referring to something else? Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Um, honestly, I, so the workers' compensation side is really far a field from my expertise. Um, so I I don't know that I'm going to have a great answer on that. Um, okay, sorry. Thank you, Monica. Um, clergy are exempt from from workers' compensation. Um, so you know what? That's a good question. Uh, what we could look at doing, and I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'll admit I was actually not aware of that. Um, you know, what we could look at doing is we could always uh, place what we call um, 
uh, uh, a death and dismemberment policy if the person suffers an injury uh, related to the job that pays out the organization and the individual for their loss. Um, the other answer is, I mean, uh, if you're exempt from WCB, um, and I, my, this is the line I would have for anyone who runs their own business or is a contractor, um, you can also purchase critical illness elsewhere, uh, insurance elsewhere for yourself. Um, like I think of like most doctors will have that coverage in place um, in case they, uh, you know, get into a car accident and can't work as a doctor anymore. That wouldn't be WCB, but that's kind of um, that's kind of coverage uh, covered elsewhere. Um, I, that's really far afield from my expertise. Um, but I, I really would encourage if, if you're not covered, if someone's not covered by by WCB, um, I'd encourage the individual to look at a critical illness policy for themselves. Um, we can look at placing a, we could look at placing um, a, a death and dismemberment policy, of course. Um, but, you know, um, the one advantage of, of critical illness is it stays with that individual regardless of where they're injured. So if you suffer an injury outside of work that prevents you from working, that's going to stick in. Um, I actually would, um, for any, any individual, um, I would always recommend a, a critical illness. Um, you never know what life's going to throw at you. Um, I know I've had a friend who had a pretty bad work, uh, non-workplace injury and her critical illness policy was really kept the roof over her head. Um, so um, that's not my expertise, but your uh, usually your financial planner should be able to help you with that one. I'm also getting a few um, messages and chats from our synod treasurers who are answering this question. And so I'll just encourage everybody to make sure that you know who your synod treasurer is. And if you have questions related to this, to be in touch with them. Um, one of our treasurers mentioned that this could vary province to province. So um, we'll want to make yes. sure that we uh, yeah, are aware of those uh, little nuances to this. Yes. Perfect. Um, a question about abuse coverage. Um, not sure I understand the comment at the beginning of the webinar. Is there a policy for the ELCIC as a whole and then also for individual churches that purchase the coverage through the group policy? Yes. Yeah. So we cover both sides of it. Um, we have um, we have the office policy, of course, for the ELCIC head office um, that includes abuse coverage. So that protects the master organization. Um, and then each church will maintain an individual policy. Um, and again, that's just recognizing that if someone suffers that they they might list the individual church or the church council as part of their lawsuit. They'll almost certainly also include the head office, the head organization. So, yes, both facets covered off. Um, someone asked, how do I obtain a copy of the group policy for my own church records? Oh, we should be, short answer is we should be sending that. Uh, when they're talking about the insurance policy, the, like the commercial policy. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. It was how do okay. I obtain a copy of the group policy? Um, short answer is, um, Maybe if that individual could contact me um, or or um, uh, if they want to contact you and, and you relay them, um, we'll be able to provide that. Uh, you know, we um, we uh, I took over the program a couple of years ago and I, I found our contact sheets. Um, there was a bit of a leg. We had a gentleman in Toronto, Dennis Fitzgerald, who did this program for years. He uh, unfortunately passed about five, six years ago. Um, and during that period, the record keeping got a little spotty. So some of the contact lists weren't updated. I know um, we've certainly had folks who said, hey, we're, I'm no longer the contact on the church. Um, so if you haven't received any documentation, reach out to me. Um, I'll, I'll be able to get that to you. Okay. And maybe at the end of all of this, we can include your contact information for people. Yes, and, yes that'd be um, great. Yeah, I'm also getting a couple questions about providing the name and phone number for some of the regional Aon reps. And uh, maybe we can just talk about that at the end. We include those on the ELCIC website as well. So. Yeah, yeah. I'll, and I'll get a list out because um, we have a new contact in Saskatchewan. The rest have been the same for a couple of years, but I'll, I'll make sure everyone knows who their regional contact is. Perfect. All right. Um, how are values established for co-insurance? For present or sale value or re uh, replacement value? Replacement value. So it's not going to necessarily be the market value. Um, it will be basically the cost to rebuild that structure from scratch. 
Um, one item um, I mentioned getting a building evaluation done. Um, when you do that, usually the building evaluator will give you two numbers. They'll say, this is your market value. This is what you would sell it for if, if you were selling it. And this is how much it would cost to rebuild it in its, in its current condition. Um, there's going to be a big disparity. Um, churches are very... They're not they're not they're not buildings that are easily convertible to to other things without a serious amount of capital. So most churches are probably going to have have a higher rebuild value versus market value. Right. Okay. Does D and O coverage also cover pastors in their role on the council? Yes, the pastor would be considered an officer of the church, and they would be covered under that. Does the program provide for reduced premiums for incre increased deductibles? Yes. I knew there was something I'd forgotten to include on this. Next one. Um, yes. Um, and this is actually something we've we've raised with Ecclesiastical. Um, so I think the starting deductible is $2,500, um, which is these days as low as you'll see commercial. Um, you know, eight years ago when I started insurance, 1000 was common. Um, that's almost... Uh, you'll ne almost never see that as, as an initial. So um, 2,500 is kind of what every church is booked into standard. Um, we could look at um, five, 10 and $25,000 deductibles. Um, I actually, I'm, you know, I do encourage, uh, I would encourage everyone to, to look at going with a higher deductible. Um, it can reduce premium. Um, we obviously have to get the insurer to agree to how much that reduces the rate. Um, but also realistically, if, if you have a, if you have a you know a thousand dollar loss, you're probably not going to file a claim. And in, in practice, I, I think I find that even if a church has like a three thousand dollar loss, yeah, you'll get a little bit of money back if if you do file a claim. But we're talking about five hundred dollars after the deductible. Most churches have that I've spoken to have preferred to pay that out of pocket. So um, I know it can seem kind of scary to raise the deductible, but I think a good question to ask is realistically, would you file these smaller claims? Because if the answer is no, go with the other deductible, save a bit of money. Okay. Um, question is equipment breakdown considered boiler? Yes, yes. The two are interchangeable. Um, equipment breakdown is the language the industry uses, um, but boiler it effectively means the same thing. And can you speak a little bit more about what miscellaneous liability is? Okay, so on your policy, if you see the miscellaneous liability, that's your abuse coverage. Um, I don't know why insurers, they don't like to say that word, abuse, um, branding, but um, when you see coverage for miscellaneous liability, usually that's for an abuse policy. Um, now, you always have to check the wording on on. On, on the actual docs, but in this case, that would be referring to abuse coverage. I had a qu couple questions asking for clarification on what is considered crime? Like, what does it cover? Um, what is it considered? Yeah. So usually in the context of this program, we're, we're talking about um, theft of cash, securities, or employee dishonesty. Um, the nice thing about having the council set up is it really minimizes the risk of, of having one person who could potentially be raiding bank accounts. Um, so that's kind of crime coverage. Now, if you have someone, you know, come and throw a rock through your, your building and they, and they start a fire, um, that's going to be covered under your property portion. Um, so it, it, yeah, it kind of, uh, property inc does include certain losses from crime, but crime's meant to cover kind of direct financial losses, theft of funds, um, theft of cash, that sort of thing. Um, question in regards to the odd hall rental for birthday anniversary, uh, it is sometimes not feasible for them to acquire a special event insurance. What is covered under our policy for these one ofs? Um, it has been indicated that we acknowledge that we would have these rentals um, at time of renewal, or we could call and inform each time these rentals occur. So you're gonna you will be covered for regular rentals. It's 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 seen as kind of part of the operations. Um, so you are covered. Um, it it never hurts to check in with us if if you do want to contact us and just say hey we're doing an event. 
Um, more often than not, we'll just say, yeah, it should be good. Like we, you know, we'll send an email to ecclesiastical and just say, by the way, this church is doing that this weekend. Um, where we do is, as we kind of touched on earlier, um, if there's alcohol being served, um, that's where you really, really do need to look at the liability. And, you know, there's a practical side of it too. Like if you have, um, you know, if you have a celebration of life, presumably it's going to be tight family, you know, you're probably not worried about people getting out of control. Um, but really when you want to look at these special event policies is if you're doing an event that's, you know, a, a, you know, something that goes until midnight, you know, might have some music, dancing, a band play, those are kind of more the exposures. So it, it do, we do look at it in a case by case basis. We can pick, we can place a special event policy for anything. Um, but I also will acknowledge there's maybe a practical constraint where, yeah, you know, if it's if it's your grandma's uh, celebration of life, you probably don't need to worry about people driving home inebriated, hopefully. So further to that in your examples, um, this came in on the chat. It says, some years we have served wine at a congregational agape meal on the Thursday before Good Friday. Is this okay? You know, that should be okay. I, I think it, that's one of those where let's de uh, declare that as, as part of the operations. We'll note it with the insurer. And actually, this, sorry, I'm going to pull something up and make a note. Um, just bear with. I'm going to ask the underwriter on their stance on that, because that's a really good point. Again, um, you're you're probably not having a point where people are getting out of control. Um, really, the thing with liquor service is if people are overserved and they drive home and hurt someone, that's where you really get into get into trouble. So circumstance matters. I, I think it's something that we might know with ecclesiastical. Um, my suspicion would be if we told them churches do this occasionally, their response is, yeah, thanks for letting us know. That's fine. But I'll, I'll review with the underwriter and I'll see if he has any feedback on, on how we should approach that. Perfect. Uh, I have just a couple more questions here. Um, one person asked, is it possible to get a risk management inspection via Aon or Ecclesiastical? Um, ecclesiastical in theory should be sending out inspectors to each church. Um, in practice, they're so understaffed right now that I, I'm not going to hold my breath for that happening. Um, we do have an Aon risk management team. Um, now, uh, they can provide some of these services, um, but really the qualified appraisers are, are the ones you really want to want to talk to. Um, I actually had a phone call with um, a gentleman from um, Cushman and Wakefield, which is a national organization. They do a in addition to property management, they do these risk inspections. Um, they had someone in our Winnipeg office who actually had a specialty uh, of working with churches. So um, my recommendation actually, uh, you know, maybe it's something where we look at compiling churches that would like to get a, a risk management inspection done. Um, if we get a few numbers, we could probably leverage a group great right from Cushman Wakefield. Um, again, I, I spoke to a gentleman from their office uh, about a month ago about doing this. So um, and that's actually something I should I'll include on the next presentation. Um, so talk to us. Uh, we have that contact. And, and, you know, if we get a group of churches together, yeah, we probably could leverage a bit of a discount, save everyone some money. And that way you're dealing with a qualified third party. Um, another question that came in, is there a loss of income coverage in the master policy? So we... Because the churches are run as, as nonprofits, um, we haven't in the past included uh, included business interruption. That's sort of what this that would be called. Um, basically, how that works is if your location's out and you're not able to, like, if uh, use the example of if you run a shop and it burns down and you're out of the shop for six months now, you're going to get income replacement on that. Um, with churches, I mean. I guess the sense would be if if donations started to dry up because the physical building wasn't there, I, I could see that exposure. It's not as heavy. I, I wouldn't view this as being a major exposure, um, but it's something we could explore doing. Um, I think that'd be something we'd have to check with ecclesiastical. Uh, we would need to get some information, like the ch a church would have to provide us some um, 
likely we need to get audited financials um, probably for the past couple of years. And, and we kind of look at setting a limit. Um, but again, realistically, if, you know, heaven forbid a, a church burns down, um, I would hope that the donations don't dry up, that folks still keep, keep you know, their, their tithing or their, their weekly contributions in. Um, so if you're not going to really worry about losing that income, um, you know, it's not as huge of an exposure. But again, maybe a church does a lot of rentals. You make a lot of income that way. Um, yes, something we could look at having added, and, and that's a conversation for ecclesiastical for income replacement. Okay, yeah, they just clarified it's income from rental of facilities. Okay, yeah, you know what, let me, I'll see if that, um, we'll see if there, uh, if that's something we could look at offering. I think that's a, that's a fair question. So it's, it's something we'll go back to the insurer on and see what they say. Perfect. And then I have one last question. It came in actually before the session started today. Um, and you, you touched on it a little bit, but I think the language that you used was a little different. Um, this person asks, is asking about the difference between replacement cost and EUC, so efficiency utility cost. Um, we have been discussing issues related to this and what might happen if we had a total loss. What would we actually rebuild and how would it compare to the existing building? Our needs are not the same as when we built the building, um, hmm. so we would like to examine other potential options like efficiency utility cost, but we're unclear about how this might be possible and what the cost difference might be. So you would see, and this is one, I'm going to make a note on this. I don't think we have, um, usually in, um, so in insurance, we, we'd usually use the term um, actual cash value, which is, as opposed to full replacement cost, um, it includes basically the actual cash value of the particular building. Um, the issue with that is you might not get the full, frankly, what the full building is worth if, if you do suffer a total loss. Um, it's something we could look at. Um, the problem is, especially for older churches, you might get dinged with a pretty heavy depreciation once you start to do that. So um, it's it's an option and it might make sense for, for individual, individual churches to pursue. Um, my general rule is I, I get nervous with ACV because the claims payouts aren't as good. Um, they are a little less restrictive, but um, again, the insurer will will go really heavily on on amortization, and and you, you know you might end up getting less than what you thought you were going to get. So um, let me take that back. I'll, I'll see this if this is an option, and I. My thinking is we could get this approved if a church wanted to move to that. Um, again, we just want to make sure uh, folks are, you know, fully aware of of the the you know how that would respond and how that would affect their policy. But short answer is I think this is something we could look at. Yeah, I just had somebody else chime in that say that said um, like for instance one of the things they wouldn't replace if they were rebuilding would be their oak pews. So right. That's a good question. I, you know, I, I think that's, it's worth exploring is the short answer because yeah, I, I know, you know, if, if you're dealing, like, I think we have a church, a couple churches on the program that are uh, older than Confederation. Um, and if they burnt down, there's, it just wouldn't be possible to rebuild them to their, their current glory and splendor. So um, that's, I think, worth talking, uh, worth a conversation and something we can uh, raise with the insurer. That's all the questions that I've had come in on the chat or otherwise for this evening. Um, before we turn it back to Peace for some closing remarks, I wonder, Rob, if you want to just um, clarify how people can get in touch with you or um, with the reps if they have any follow up, and also how we'll do some of the follow up on the on what you're going to look into further. Yeah, so um, I'm thinking, Trina, it might make sense. Let me get a contact sheet out to you to distribute to this group. Um, it'll include my uh, my contact. Um, my contact card, when you get it, does have my cell number. Um, so please don't call me at midnight. Um, but um, uh, it'll have my email, and then we'll have the regional reps. Um, I am ultimately, uh, I do, so I, I'm i the local contact for uh, Manitoba, Ontario, Um but I uh, and we do have local contacts in the other regions, but I also oversee the the, the national program. So um, a lot of questions end up filtering their way to me anyway. So feel free to, you know, yeah, shoot me an email, a text call, um, and I'll I'll get that contact and put a Utrina to distribute.
Wow, it's been a great evening. <laughs> I hope we all enjoyed the section. Um, Trina, thank you so much for the way you coordinated the question section and um, Rob for promptly providing the answers. And I hope for everyone that asked questions, we got the responses that we want to get. Uh, if we still have more, we have more time. <laughs> but I believe um, it's been a very interactive section and I want to say thank Thank you so much to Rob for coming to answer all of those questions and to enlighten us the more. We have the same um, webinar on the 9th, 9th of March. And um, if you register for this one and you feel like you want to hear more, I don't think we are restricting anyone from joining again. Or you go home and um, you remember there are more questions that you wanted to ask and you've not asked. Please bring it over on the 9th and I'm sure Rob will be happy to answer us. And um, I think on this note, we've had a good time and um, we'll be saying a goodbye to everyone and a good night. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Peace. And I do appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank Take you care. so much. Bye-bye. Yeah.